Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. Uh, let's have a word of prayer. Father, we're thankful for the privilege and the opportunity to gather together to worship you and to feast upon your word. We're also keenly aware of how little we know. May the Holy Spirit be our only teacher. Filtering out foolishness and ignorance, but really opening our minds, our, our hearts, our eyes to the truth that you would have us know. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. We uh, are studying 1 Corinthians verse by verse, and in our last study together, we had uh, essentially we had finished the first chapter, which ended with the words, He that boasts, or he that glories, he that, he that boasts in the Lord, uh, let him boast in the Lord. And there is no chapter uh, break here, of course, in, in the original text. And I, brethren, and I, brethren, uh, came to you, uh, when I came to you, I came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God, for I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God, and so there is a uh, there is a clear and, and close connection between the end of chapter one and the beginning of chapter two, and we saw that chapter one is replete with evidences of the sovereignty of God. I can't I can't imagine anyone reading First Corinthians chapter one and not coming away with the conviction that God is supremely sovereign that he's sovereign that he directs and that he chooses the message of first corinthians chapter one in brief if i could quickly sum that up is that we are redeemed and delivered solely by grace our focus is on christ not self which is foolishness to a world which boasts in its own wisdom and its own capabilities, its own performance. It is clearly an indictment against a world religious system that is bedrock fastened to the idea that man has to do something to be redeemed, which is not what we've seen here, and neither is it what we've seen in any other study that we've, uh, any other book or epistle that we've studied. You know, man, you know, people want to deny God the right to choose, but boy, they, they zealously hold on to their right to choose. And the chapter ends that he that boasts, let him boast in the Lord, because God is the one who is sovereign. God is the one who directs. God's the one that chooses. So I also, brethren, when I came to you, I didn't come with excellency of speech. I didn't come with superior words, you know, words of man's wisdom. Uh, the word there is logos, uh, excellency of speech or of wisdom, but I declared unto you the testimony of God. God, of course, there is a genitive, and you have to decide whether to take it subjectively or objectively. Is this a testimony about God, or is it God's testimony? And as you probably know me, uh, it's God's testimony. But... Uh, I can take it either either way. It's it's God's witness or it's God's testimony that the Holy Spirit has Paul declaring. And these are not Paul's words. Paul just merely held the pen. Verse 2, for I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. I, says Paul, made the decision not to know a single thing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. 
Now, at first glance, that seems to be pretty simple. You know, Jesus Christ, that's who he was. He was born in, in, uh, in Bethlehem. He grew up in Nazareth. He was tried for uh, crimes that he didn't commit, uh, condemned to death by means of crucifixion outside the city of Jerusalem. That's not it. To look at, at what the world may see in Jesus Christ is to miss the point. He's God crucified. But it isn't the fact that he was nailed to a cross that's important. It's but that he died the death of a criminal so that I, who am a criminal, need not die. He who knew no sin was made sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. The question should be, was he made sin for me? And if so, if he was, then you're made the righteousness of God in him. You couldn't be any better off. On the other hand, if he was not made sin for you, then you are not his child. Well, that's a disturbing thought. And, you know, for most ministers, difficult to preach. It was, wasn't any problem for Paul to preach it. There are any number of people who say, well, you don't understand. You know, when he was made sin for us, that was everybody. But it is not made effective until you accept him as your personal Lord and Savior, until you come to believe or accept him. It, folks, it doesn't say that he was made sin for everybody. It says that he was made sin for us. That's what the text says. But it doesn't stop there. And we were made the righteousness of God in him. So if the us is everybody, if the us is everybody, everybody was made the righteousness of God in him. So it doesn't make any sense to make us everybody. Therefore, it must be those who are made righteous. Now, there are many who say, well, that's correct. You're made righteous if you accept Christ and believe this, but if you don't believe it, and if you don't accept Christ, then you're not made righteous. And then our verse falls apart for uh, somebody that he died for wasn't made righteous. Somebody that he was made sin for was not made righteous, and that doesn't make any sense. And then, you know, when someone says, well, I still believe it's when I accept him that I'm made righteous. Fine, okay? Uh, do you think God knew that, that you were going to do that? Now, now, if he didn't know that you were going to do that, he's ignorant, and I don't want an ignorant God. You can have him. If he did know that you were going to do that, you couldn't have done anything else. So no matter how you look at it, this Jesus Christ, whom I have determined to know nothing else but him, this Jesus Christ and him crucified is the word of God. It's just what we've been studying. He is the almighty, eternal God who spoke the worlds into existence, who hung the stars in the sky. You know, I've been uh, in several... Uh, services where some leader wants to go around and ask everybody when they were born again. And when they ask me, I say before the foundation of the world, and that blows everything up. When, when, folks, when does a dog become a dog? You know, when does a goat become a goat? When does a sheep become a sheep? It is inconceivable to me when you read this book that anybody anybody could come to the conclusion that, well, we were all goats uh, headed for hell until some of us accepted Christ, and then we were transformed, miraculously transformed into sheep. Dearly beloved, we were planted as sheep. We were born as sheep. We grew as sheep, and we'll go to heaven as sheep. We are his. 
He was made sin for us, and we are made the righteousness of God in him. And that's more inconceivable, okay, I think, than it, uh, than it appears really at, at, on the surface. The righteousness of God. Folks, is there a greater righteousness than the righteousness of God? And, and, and that in spite of the way that the Corinthians or, or you or, or I or anyone, any Christian lives. We are made the righteousness of God in Christ. Well, Steve, I don't live like it. I sure don't look like it. You're made the righteousness of God in him. Dearly beloved, you couldn't be any more righteous than what you are right now. That's what the Holy Spirit has Paul determined to know. That's what we need to know. The only way that Christ could get his sheep into heaven, you know, to redeem his sheep, was to be made sin for them. Okay? Please be technically correct. He was not made a sinner. Jesus Christ did not sin, and I'll state it more emphatically. Jesus Christ could not sin. It, it isn't that he could sin and he, and he didn't. It's that he could not sin. He was God. God of very God. But he was willing to be made sin. The horror of that absolutely staggers my mind. He was willing to be made sin for me. And yet I have Christians say, I'm not really sure God loves me. You know, I, I I got an ingrown toenail or some serious thing like that. I said that purposely because I don't think a single thing ever touches your life that is anywhere near as serious as sin. We not only should expect to suffer because God told us that he gave us that as a privilege. You ought to recognize every suffering that comes into your life is an examination of how much you're trusting him. Do you really believe him? Do you really trust him? This is the Jesus Christ of Scripture. And in that blackness on the cross, the almighty, eternal God was making the incarnation sin. No wonder he cried out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? In Acts chapter 18, we're told that Paul spent his time in Corinth preaching the Word of God. And this book, this book is the Word of God. It's the revelation of the person and the work of Jesus Christ. It's not an instruction book on how to live the Christian life. It is a revelation of the person and work of Jesus Christ. We read in Genesis 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Well, in Colossians, we saw this. When we studied through Colossians, we saw that it is Christ who spoke the worlds into existence. The same God. He's in the first verse, the first chapter of the first book of the Bible, and he's the glorified Lord and Redeemer in the last chapter of Revelation. I believe he's mentioned in the last verse of the last chapter of Re Revelation. He's the Alpha and the Omega. All of this book speaks of Jesus Christ, how he dealt with his people, how he loved his people. Yet in book after book after book, he points out how much they disobeyed him. They, they were just like us, but he loved them. They suffered that they might learn that they should trust him. So do we. It was my determination. I, I still believe our author is the Holy Spirit. So in the last analysis, it is the Spirit's determination to know nothing except Christ and him crucified. It certainly expresses the Holy Spirit's desire that we are of the same mind, which we saw in chapter 1, which is a presentation of the person and the work of Jesus Christ. Verse 3, And I was with you, that expression to me, I, I would translate that, I stood face to face before you. I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. 
When you saw me, I was weak, fearful, and trembling. I'm going to suggest that if we were to have seen Jesus back then, what we would have seen would not have been someone so so handsome, so remarkable, so entertaining, you know, that we'd miss the message that he was preaching. I'm not going to suggest that Christ was, was there in weakness and in fear. I'm going to suggest that that's the way the Holy Spirit says that his message appears. Now, we can read that and, and, and we can say that Paul was sort of sick. Well, he had the flu or something. You know, maybe he had COVID, uh, you know. You know, the, the fear could be that uh, that he had respect for the congregation or he was concerned about what his message was or, or he was physically afraid of some kind of persecution or something. And that he did tremble. His hand shook. You know, when he stood before them, they could see him trembling. I think what verse 3 says is that when I was face to face before you, I didn't command any respect. Isn't that like what we see in our Lord? We don't know where he went to school. Uh, you know, many believed uh, Jesus to be uh, an illegitimate child. He only worked as a carpenter. You know, he didn't write anything except in the sand. And, you know, no one took a photograph of that. Uh, he didn't travel a lot. As far as we know, he never left the land of Palestine. And that's not very big. It's about the, about the probably about the fourth of the size of the state of Oklahoma. So he wasn't a well-traveled man. As far as uh, people were concerned, he wasn't a well-educated man. Now, he did feed a, a multitude of people. He, he did walk on water. He did raise the dead. He did heal lepers. He touched a leper. You know, little incidental things like that. But there's no in question in my mind that when somebody came running to you, you know, and, and said, you know, uh, that man raised Lazarus from the dead, you wouldn't have believed it. Well, uh, maybe. Uh, now, if you happen to be one of those fortunate enough to be there when Lazarus was raised, that's a different thing. But when we look at the total population, clearly the majority of people would have said, I just don't believe it. I'm not saying that he was sick or weak. What I am saying is he looked that way. He didn't command a lot of respect until he fed 5,000 or, or, or more people some or some miracle, did some miracle that may have caused people some temporary respect that would soon evaporate and die out. You realize that, that if, if the only reason that, that you believed in Jesus Christ is because of some miracle that occurred in your life, it would slowly die out. It would cease to be worth anything. But genuine faith never dies out. And so I think that's the way Paul appeared. And I believe that's the way you appear. And I appear. I think Paul appeared to the Corinthians exactly in context with what we know about Christ. You know, people get so excited now, especially nowadays, over all the, the, the glitter, all the show, you know, some minister puts on, some church program, whatever, you know, that's exciting. But they don't get that excited in the Word. I could put a big ad out there that we're going to have a, a discussion of polonial halos and their bearing on creation or prophecy that Jesus is coming soon or, or something like that. We'd get a huge surge in views here. Uh, but we, I could also advertise that we're going, to, we're going to have a discussion on the deity, the purpose, and the person of the Lord Jesus Christ and not many people of you are going to click on the video. I think just, I mean, the evidence of that is pretty, pretty clear. I've, uh, I've proven that just by teaching verse by verse, but that doesn't bother me. My words and my proclamation absolutely were not with enticing words. And that word enticing is an interesting word. 
it's pythos. It's uh, it's the word is persuade. I'm not persuading you with enticing words of man's wisdom. Now, I mean, it's, that's different than persuading you with God's wisdom. I'm not persuading you with, with man's wisdom. But in demonstration of the spirit and of power. You know, I don't want my preaching to be persuasive words of men's wisdom. And my constant prayer is that it's a simple presentation of certain facts that God has established that lead us to marvel at his sovereignty, to wonder at his grace. I do not want to use persuasive words of man's wisdom. Neither do I want to tout my education or my credentials. I'll try to present known facts and make application from those facts, not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power. In demonstration of the spirit and of power. Well, what is that? What is that? Is that giving sight to the blind, raising the dead? Is, is that what it means in the demonstration of the spirit and of power? Well, there are many who believe that. Uh, that apparently Paul's ministry in Corinth was accompanied by many miracles that demonstrated God's presence and God's power. Well, they're not mentioned in Acts, and they don't seem to fit the context, folks, of our present study. And I've tried to point out the importance of context. Hopefully that helps you study. I think that demonstration is the fact that any Corinthian, Greek or Jew, would, if they were God's child, believe what was taught by Paul without fancy words of wisdom. And I think that's there for us. You can't, by logic, by persuasion, by science, argue anybody into heaven, anybody into believing the scriptures or to believe Jesus Christ is the Lord of their life. You can't do that. The natural man doesn't receive the things of the Spirit of God. It isn't that he won't receive them. He cannot receive the things of the Spirit of God. I don't spend my time trying to do that. Because I know that those who belong to God, I know the Holy Spirit will filter out all of my foolishness and seal truth to those who are His. But it's foolishness to everybody else. And I think that's a marvelous demonstration of power. You know, here's some guy or, or some gal that lived, you know, I don't know, 30, 40, 50 years, whatever, who wanted nothing to do with the church, never went to church, didn't want anything to do with the church, didn't want anything to do with, with God, didn't want anything to do with Christ. If somebody told them about the Lord, they would, they'd tell them to shut up or they'd walk away. You know, before I knew I was God's child, I wouldn't listen to anybody. When I was invited to church, I wouldn't go. If I if I heard a sermon, if I heard a church service on the radio or, or TV, I'd turn it off. I wanted nothing to do with Christ. And then one day, I was walking along with a friend of mine. And he said something that made me stop dead in my tracks. God became man and dwelt among us. I'd never heard that before in my life. That was all he said. And for some reason, I didn't turn him off. I listened to this man for 30 minutes or more. It was probably more like an hour. And it was hot outside. And when he finished, I suddenly felt unlike anything I had felt before. I had to listen, and I wanted to know more. Now, I could sit here and I could tell you that that was me that decided to do that. But I think I'd be lying. And when I heard the gospel that Paul preached come out of this man's mouth, my life was no longer the same, and I knew that. And I had not done anything, dearly beloved not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. Verse 5, 
that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. That's where we'll pick up next time. I want to thank you all so much for studying together with us in these verse-by-verse -verse studies. I want to thank you all for all of your love, your comments, your support, everything. Rest in him. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.